is a World War II veteran of the, was in the Navy in both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters, and he's going to tell us of his experiences in World War II while serving in the Navy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And the day is November the 29th, 2001. It's been a few days since World War II, and now here's Mr. Henry. And now. Okay. And everybody calls me Chuck because that's what my dad called me. My, Did you get the first one? Mm -hmm. My mother named me, and uh, for some reason or other, my dad never thought much of royal. So I was always buck to my dad and royal to my mother. So I was like being two people. I kind of grew up a little schizo, I guess. That's right. <laughs> okay. But uh, I knew from the time I was 15 years old that I was going to be involved in, in war because I even as a young man, I kept abreast of, of the things that was going on in the world. Right. And when I turned 17 years old, I was in town one Saturday afternoon. I was probably the middle of July of 1941. And I met a Marine down at the courthouse that was recruiting. Here in Sterling. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought I'd make a good recruit and man that monkey suit he was wearing that seagull and bell off looked great to me i just see me walking down the street and that and all the girls falling on their knees you know <laughs> so i just enlisted and of course i took it home to that old red-headed scott's daddy of mine and he tore it up telling me that i still had a year of school which i did then of course pearl harbor happened and and i immediately the day after pearl went down and and uh, enlisted in the Navy. Right. There was Judd Harvey and Fried Setterberg and I. We were kind of bosom buddies in high school. And we were all going to be carrier pilots, fighter pilots. And, of course, my dad informed me that I still hadn't finished high school and, <laughs> and that uh, there was going to be plenty of the war left for me, and he was sure as hell right about that. But was your uh, dad was your dad a bigger man than you are? My dad was six three and weighed about two forty five. Okay, go ahead. And was red headed. So you paid attention to he him. He was a Scotsman. Yeah, very much so. But uh, anyway, they both went on and became fighter pilots, yeah, carrier pilots. And I, of course, turned eventually turned eighteen years old in July after I graduated from high school, and and I kept hinting at my dad that I wanted to go up, you know, it was, it was my job, but I was ready for it. And uh, finally he got me a job on the railroad in the office, you know, the uh, rip track office, thinking that that was a pretty good job and maybe I'd just forget about going to service. I had never even registered for the draft yet. And I went to him one day and I said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to go. I've, I've, got to, I've got to do it. So I enlisted and he, and of course he didn't have to sign for me because I was 18. But I left Sterling on uh, November 17th of 1942. And you talk about a homesick kid. I don't think I'd ever spent two nights away from my parents. Yeah. Kids were different in then days and now, you know. Sure. Now, mm -hmm. Friday night, they're either at Johnny's place or Johnny's at their place. But, uh, and Bing Crosby come out with this White Christmas song, and I hate that song to this day. <laughs> I hate Bing Crosby. <laughs> anyway, I, I left here and went to uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It was a brand new boot camp up there. The Navy had just opened. And I think we were in the third company to go through it. And incidentally, they're burying one of the boys today, Joe Rinaldo, was right. in boot camps with me. Okay. And uh, we we spent uh, eight weeks in boots, and then they come down. Somebody in the in the camp came down with spinal meningitis, so we were quarantined for another thirty days. And there was about I think there was ninety seven in my company boot camp, and. Uh, there was about 10 of us that scored high enough to go to school. And if we hadn't have gone to school, we could have had a 10-day availability leave to go home, you know, 10 mm -hmm. days plus travel time. 
And I thought maybe it'd be better if I go to school, so I, I went to San Diego school to a torpedo school. Another eight week deal. The Navy could do about anything in eight weeks. That was the yeah, that, that was, was the number, yeah. huh? Yeah, they, you were an expert at whatever you're gonna do. In eight weeks time you could accomplish it. <laughs> okay. So I went through the first eight week school, preliminary school, and uh, went from well I start, went enlisted as an apprentice seaman and then when I got out of boots I was a seaman too. And then when I got out of this first advanced school I was or preliminary school I was a seaman first class. Well I scored high enough in that for the advanced class and so another eight weeks and I'm a petty officer third class. Wow. And they send me from uh, San Diego straight across the country to Brooklyn, New York to a brand new destroyer. Well, I get into New York and uh, I'm there, but my ear's not. You know, that losing this luggage isn't anything that just happened recently. <laughs> that happened on trains as well as airplanes. So that I didn't get to go aboard ship. I, they sent me out to a place on Long Island called the Lido Hotel. And I don't know whether you've ever been out of the country or not, but the Lido was a real exclusive hotel mm. full of sailors. And of course, they'd taken up all the plush carpets and the and the fine uh, fixtures and everything. And uh, about the first morning I was there, why they come out and they wanted to know everybody that had at least two years of college. Well, we had a lot of college boys in the service, you know. And of course, they were real proud to think that it was quite a bit advanced to us. So <laughs> they stepped forward, and uh, then the next thing was truck drivers, and that was kind of a premium deal, too. You know, if you could drive a truck, that was pretty great. But I didn't volunteer for anything. I, I, an old man told me when I left her, he said, don't, don't volunteer, volunteer for a volunteer. damn thing, and I never did. <laughs> so anyway, 30 minutes later, the college boys are out raking the beach, and the truck drivers are unloading a carload of coal <laughs> with wheelbarrows. But anyway, my ship got back in off and shake down, and uh, I went aboard ship about the middle of July in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And that was July of 40? 40 43. 43, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd been in, what, nine months. Yeah, three months. And, uh, I went aboard ship as a third class petty officer and was assigned a number one torpedo mount. <laughs> and that was my home and my workstation, my battle station, and you know, my life for the next uh, 14, 15 months. Okay. And I was aboard ship for, oh, we were operating out of Norfolk, Virginia. And I think it was about the middle of August, the Bunker Hill, which at that time was the Navy's biggest brand new aircraft carrier came down and us and two other destroyers were picked to escorted out to Pearl. So we left the Atlantic, went through Panama and in my papers it says that we hit Balboa, Panama. Well, we also hit Panama City. I see. <laughs> we, we libertied one night at one end of the canal and then got drunk the next night at the other end. So it worked out good, you know, both ways. Anyway, in there someplace is a fresh, freshwater lake right? that you, you dump out of the Atlantic into this freshwater lake and then out into the Pacific. And then we had a clean sweep and swab down in that freshwater lake. We had a big fun, a lot of fun, big water fight. And uh, then we went into San Pedro, California and uh, spent the night and then headed for Pearl the next morning. and. Uh, this aircraft carrier was huge. It's over a thousand feet long, and you know, and I don't know how many tonnage it was, but it was fast and it was big. We could do 38 knots, which was about 43 or 45 miles an hour, somewhere along in there. Yeah. And she radioed over that she was tired of putting up with us, and in two hours' time, she was out of sight and went on to Pearl by herself. Wow, is that she right? She was in birth when we got there. We was popping rivets trying to keep up with her, but anyway, we were in Pearl for about, oh, I guess probably four or five weeks, war games doing, out in the, under Diamond Head, playing war games, you know, shooting off dummy torpedoes and things. 
and we wound up uh, headed for the Gilbert Islands. And that was our first battle that we were involved in. And uh, I remember the night before we landed the, the army on Macon, Macon was the first island in the group that they took, that he came on the intercom telling us that this was the first offensive action of the Navy in World War II and that it would end at Tokyo, which you were sure as hell right, that's where it ended, but I wasn't with the ship when it got there. Anyway, we made, we, we went in about, oh, just about an hour before daybreak and started shelling it. These islands are little skinny islands, you know, they're maybe a mile and a half, two miles wide and seven or eight, ten miles long. But they was filthy with Japs. And we shelled Macon for about six or seven hours and it looked like somebody had gone through with a giant hedgehog and just trimmed the trees all off. I mean, we, we blew everything apart. But there's still a lot of Japs on it. And we put the army ashore. And then the next morning we'd done the same thing with Tarawa or Tarawa. I don't know how you pronounce it, but the Marines thought so much of it they wrote a song about it. Right. And I sat on my torpedo mount with field glasses and watched these crazy marine kids go ashore with their rifles over their head, and I thought they was hollering bonsai the same as the Japs did, you know. Anyway, they had a lot of casualties. They, it was a pretty tough deal. But it didn't take them long to secure the island. They, you know, they went in and done it. From there, I'm not sure. We, 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 well, when we went into Tarawa, we knocked a screw off on a coral reef, which was a propeller, one of the twin propellers that had the twin urban engine and uh, so we got to stay in the lagoon there at Tarawa and of course all of the Japs that they killed they had no place to bury them so they just dozed them up on the south end of the island and of course the lagoon was like right here the, the breeze always came up out of the southeast, or the southeast at night and wafted across that pile at you know, about supper time <laughs> you know, he didn't make it too inducive to go down and have a big meal. But we were there until we left just in time to get back to Pearl Harbor for Christmas of 43 and pick up our mail and, and uh, get put in a dry dock and got a new screw put on. From there, we came back to the States, but we was only in the States for like 24 hours or so, and, and we headed north to to uh, the Aleutian Islands. And we got up in the Aleutians about the 1st of January. And we made milk, we call them our milk runs, over to the northern Japanese held islands. There was, uh, uh, I've got them in my records, I can't pronounce the name, Masui, Sarabaki, and I don't know what all they were, but anyway, they, we made, uh, I think four or five runs over there and one or two of them wasn't successful because we was always under fog and, and you know we'd get Couldn't in see. destroyers have to be pretty close to not like a battle wagon we just set out 15 miles to shell a beach we had to be within you know seven or eight miles and they still had a lot of aircraft and, and PT boats and stuff up there in fact one time we I was standing talking to a guy and we were both looking out at the ocean and uh, while we were shelling, and all of a sudden I see this torpedo trail, and I mean, it went right between us. Oh, yeah. And the only thing they figured saved us, of course, that torpedo had passed us, had missed us anyway. It, it was on ahead of us because the, the trail, uh, the wake doesn't come up for, you know, quite a ways behind the torpedo. Right. But they think that the reason that they didn't, uh, didn't hit any of us, we were the new class of destroyer in a silhouette of us. We looked like a bobtail cruiser. It was pretty bulky ships. Pretty big, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. But anyway, that was, wasn't a lot of fun. So did that there. torpedo go under you? Well, what it we did? probably had some fired under us too, but there, this particular one that I and my buddy seen, and, and he stopped talking about the same time I seen it, and of course I stopped talking too, and was wondering where in the hell my life jacket was at because I never did know where it was at. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was a lot of fun being up there because there was nothing, absolutely nothing to do. They had a Quonset on ADAC, which was our home port, and they had some Life magazines that was about a year old and a bunch of Coke syrup. There was no way of, of uh, making it fizzy, you know. And that, that's not too much of a drink. 
<laughs> but we were up there nine months. We were up there till September in Sheldy's Islands and made a battle star out of it, you know. Sure. Which gave us our second battle star. And uh, we made, I, I can't remember now, but there was five or six trips or whatever. We'd go to, uh, oh, the last island <coughs> out on the chain, and that's where we'd fuel, and then we'd go on over there. And the first time we stopped it, I can't think of the island now, that where Massacre Bay is on this island anyway. And I had, I had sleeping in about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I got a notice that I had a visitor at the quarterdeck. Well, hell, I didn't know anybody in that part of the world, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I go down and get up and get dressed and go to the quarterdeck, and here's my brother Don. Oh, really? And he, I had just written him a letter, and <coughs> he'd going to pick it his mail. Kiska was the name of the island. What's the name of it? Kiska. Kiska. I think okay. it was Kiska. Yeah. Okay, that's about right, I guess. Anyway. He said, have you got a brother in the Navy? And Don, Don said, well, sure. And he said, well, how'd you like to see him? He said, well, hell yes, I'd like to see him where he's at. And he said, he's on that tin can sitting right up there. So he came out on the on the mailboat, crawled board. And of now, course, Vietnam. What was he doing up there? He was in the Army. He was in the Army. Yeah, on, on infantry. Oh, okay. And getting drunk on rice whiskey and a lot of other things like that. But <laughs> he was kind of an ornament. But anyway, I... Uh, he stayed aboard all day long, and of course, about four o'clock that afternoon, we're fueling up and getting ready to haul out again, because that's the only reason we stopped over there was to fuel. Right. And uh, I had, being a, by that time I was the second class petty officer, and I was in charge of the acid locker where we kept the alcohol, so I had a tin of alcohol that would just pretty much disappear, you know, occasionally. I gave him a quart of, of medical alcohol. Right. Which makes a hell of a good drink. That's right. That's that 200 proof. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, we all know that. That, <laughs> that pink lady isn't very good. I got another story on pink lady. But anyway, <laughs> I kept telling Don, I said, you're going to have to get off this thing. We're, we're throwing off lines to this tanker and we're fixing to get underway. And he said, uh, how am I going to get off in here? I said, you just get outside that lifelight and hook your heels on, the, on this railing here. And I said, when I tell you jump, you jump. Well. You know, we're bypassing each other, probably 20 feet. And it looks like you're going to jump right into the other ship, but if you jump, and, and we're no, not much farther apart than you and I sitting here. And he'd start to jump, and God, he was going to jump right inside that ship. And he knew that he wasn't going really, to dump him in the, in the ocean, you know. And so he grabbed the lifeline and hang on. And after four or five trips, I said, Now, God damn it, Don, you're going to have to jump, or you're going to go up north with us. So he finally started and stopped, then he jumped and hell, he hit her clear on the bottom stroke, you know, by waiting <laughs> that split second. Mm -hmm. Wonder he didn't break both ankles. That's right. And he got up and he said, man, I didn't break my jug, and he still had his quart of alcohol, so he was happy about that, you know. I don't know how he got back to the beach. Anyway, we left and went on up there, but uh, he was kind of a bad case. He was always in trouble someplace. <laughs> But anyway, we came back to the States uh, that in uh, March, no, September of 44. And I had been, that's the next time I got home, from the time I left in, in uh, November of 42. So that you hadn't been home for two years? Yeah. Well, nearly two years. More or less, yeah. And. Uh, <coughs> And my dad, well, I, the only way I got home then, I had a kid in my gang. I had two third-class torpedo men that was in my gang, plus eight. Mm -hmm. That was the boys that I was supposed to keep busy. And this Kelly was always talking about going over the hill, and I said, well, hell, you don't need money. You don't need a, a, a what do we have, a four-day pass, I guess it was. Yeah, there was three sections of the ship, and you got four days. It's all days available. I said, you don't need that uh, four-day pass. I said, I'll give you $100 for it if you'll go down to the exec's office with me and agree to stand my duty. And he said, well, I can sure use the money. And I said, well, I'll, I'll just give you 100 That was a lot of money, you know. Hell, yeah, I'm sure. making $97 a month. 
as a second class petty officer. And uh, so he agreed to stand my duty, and so I go home, fly both ways out of Frisco. It takes me about eight hours to fly from San Francisco to Denver on an old propeller plane, you know, they didn't right. have jets in those days. And I get into Denver just in time to miss the streamliner coming home, so I had to catch a midnight milk train out of Denver, and we stopped at, you know, every place that they had a cream can sitting out on the station line to pick up. And I got in home, get in home about 12 o'clock. They didn't, nobody even knew I was in the States. So, and I knew my dad was working nights at the roundhouse in Little Rock. So I called home and a man answered the phone. And I said, well, who the hell is this? And he said, well, who the hell are you? <laughs> so I, I told him, and he said, well, I'm Don, your brother Don. Of course, he was home on an unsolicited leave. I see. So he came in with Mom and, and my kid sister Helen and picked me up. <clears throat> and we went down to the railroad where Dad was working. And there was only one engine in that big old cavernous building there. Dad seen Dad clear across the deal, and he had a big open-end ranch that he was carrying. I don't know what he's fixing to do. But he come a strolling across there, and he got up almost to me to you, and he dropped that ranch, and he said, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, well, I come back to, you know, on a visit. So anyway, we, while I was home, I shingled the folks' house. That was how excited I was about being back in Sterling. <laughs> but I, uh, then I went back, and then uh, we made the Philippine campaign, and that was another star. And by that time, what did you do in the Philippines? What your ship do? Well, we done all sorts of things. We uh, shot down several Jap planes and, and credited with one submarine. And wow, is that right? I don't know how many engagements there was that we were in in the Philippines, but we missed Lady Gulf, which was we missed it by about four hours. Everything was still smoking and steaming, but we were knocking ourselves out trying to get there, but we couldn't make, out, make uh, Lady Gulf. Lady Gulf was the biggest sea battle ever in history. Most tonnage, most men, and most lost. Is that right? Yeah. Anyway, we, uh, we got there, and, and, uh, and then we got a lot of dirty details that we, because in the interim we got a new captain, and this new captain wasn't near the man that our old skipper was. He was kind of a horse shit character, you know, that just drew all the bad stuff. And uh, we were sent up, up to, to uh, I can't think of some of these islands' names now, but it was, there was a torpedo troop ship up there that had been abandoned. <coughs> and we were sent up there to, to uh, pick it up and put a prize crew on and bring it home. And we got in there where the ship was at in this cove and sent a crew over and they had it all generated and ready to move, you know. And about that time we picked up a submarine contact. And of course this new captain we had, his name was, was Whitfield. And he, he was a full striper, but he, he had never been to sea. He was a Washington <laughs> desk uh, jockey. Yeah, yeah. desk jockey. So here we are doing about three or four knots with this crippled ship, and, and so he sets a full full uh, spray of, of uh, depth charges. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he drops that first 800-pound depth charge off in the fan tail. He blows us clear out of the damn water, you know. That's the only reason we missed Iwo Jima, was because of that action. But anyway, I was, <coughs> my battle station was at the number one torpedo mount. And I had got up there and I couldn't find my primer belt. You had to have a primer belt for, I had five torpedoes and, and they looked like a 30-30 shell, but they was, they went in the primer and, and exploded the detonator and the detonator sent the, you know, exploded the black powder to fire the torpedo. <coughs> so the next bank of torpedoes, number two torpedo mount, had a blast shield on it. It looked like a little butler grain bin, about five feet up in the air and about six feet across, and we went out the top. 
Well, just as the damn ship blew clear out of the water with this 800-pound depth charge, I was coming back out of that cone, and it threw me clear over sideways, and I slid off in the cone and hooked my belt on a bolt head that was sticking up. And I couldn't reach the ladder to get back, and I thought, good God, here I am, impaled on this thing, and we're sinking. <coughs> because there was a lot of, of uh, phosphorus in the water down there, and any, any motion, you know, just lit it up like that. Yeah, right. Man, it was just, you could see everything. And I, I finally got over and got it, got a hold of the ladder, got around to get off of it, but man, I was a scared pup for a while, I'll tell you. No but, uh, while we were down there, I think, I think we hit about every atoll in the South Pacific at one time or the other, either after we got hit, crippled, or before. We had pulled into, uh, I think it was New Britain, where the, the, uh, ammunition ship blew up. Okay. And I can't think of the name of that ship right off it, but it's in my, my records from the archives. We pulled in about two o'clock in the morning, dropped the hook, and and we were within probably 500 yards of this ship. And I was routining torpedoes that morning. I had my crew up there and, and nice and calm, so you open the back hatch on it and slide the torpedo out far enough. Your, your the mechanism, the, the motor of the torpedo was only about six feet long, and then you had your air flask and your warheads. And I pulled them out and checked fuel tanks and, and spun the, the gyro and, you know, just routining them. And they passed a word to, re, you know, secure everything and we were getting underway to fuel. Well, I put the torpedoes all back in and buttoned them down and, and uh, we were just tying up to the oiler when the hood, Mount Hood, was the name of the ship. It blew. Oh, you were right there when that blew up? Yep. Wow. And there was trash. Even at, we was probably close to a mile away, a few thousand yards away, I imagine, when it blew. But there was still stuff from that ship that hit, come down on our ship. Oh, yeah. And I mean, when, when the smoke cleared, there was nothing there. That, that ship would, had just flat disappeared. And we had been involved in, in other uh, ammunition ships that had been hit. Uh, one time in the Philippines, when we first got down there, we were under attack by, by suicide planes, and they hit this army uh, LCI that was a, a landing craft right. that they was using for an ammo ship. Yeah. And that son of a gun would explode in 30 minutes, and it would explode, and it almost come clear out of the water, because you only draw about six or seven feet of water anyway. But anyway, our job before darkness left, we were supposed to sink that raft and get it out of sight because hell, it's still floating, you know. We picked up all the survivors from it, and boy, there was a lot of boys butchered on that thing. And uh, there was some medals given for getting in close enough to do all that, too. But uh, we had a hell of a time getting that thing out of sight. It was too shallow to fire a torpedo at, and, uh, you know, five-inch 38 guns, we, we penetrated the armor on it easily enough. Boy, you had to hit it right at the water line or, you know, because that, that damn thing, I, I didn't know they could withstand the punishment that it took because it was all day long exploding, just one blast after another. But this hood, there was just one blast and it was, it was hit. Gone, huh? There was no survivors whatsoever on it. It was like this thing at the towers here the other day. It was, you know, it was just gone. It just evaporated. Hmm. And there was, well, there were survivors. There were 16 men and, and one officer that was on the beach. Oh, on the beach, yeah. And they had just taken over a load of bombs. But they thought it was the thing that made it blow. But it, it had to be wired. It, that thing had to be sabotaged some way because even fused bombs wouldn't have just been one blast. It would have been a series of blasts. It was a big ship that had was several tons, you know, yeah. hundreds and thousands. But anyway, then we, we went on with all of the Philippine battles that was involved in this, which I, the ship just got one star for. But in Langayan Gulf in Luzon, we, we started north up through the South China Sea, 
and we stopped at Bataan and Fregador. Bataan, I don't know which is which, but one's just a little rock island out there, and the other one's a harbor. And that's where the death march yeah, the started from. General Wainwright, you know, retired his deal and took their money and put it in sealed ammunition boxes and dumped it in the harbor out there. But we done the same thing with Japs done. They they hung around there and hung around until they thought we was gonna land there. Then they went up and landed at Lungai and Gulf and Luzon and we done the same thing. We made two or three passes at at uh, Baton, Craigador, and then we pulled back out and went into to Luzon, into Lingayan Gulf, they called it. And we had orders. There was a monastery in there that we weren't supposed to shell. There was a brewery. Now, why are the brewery? I don't know. Somebody <laughs> must have had some money in that thing. Wasn't supposed to shell this brewery, and then MacArthur's home, his palatial home, was in Luzon. And, of course, hell, you had to shell them because that's where all the gaps was at. Sure. So we get in and we just make about one pass the whole men of war, you know, there was wagons and cruisers and us and everything. And we just make one one pass and we were supposed to have a lot of air cover. There was a lot of plates in the air, but they all had meatballs, you know. It's all gaps. Right. And they ran us back out to sea right into a damn hurricane and we was in that hurricane for three days. Wow. I mean a bad hurricane, right right in it. When it's when you can get topside and see the screws of a battle wagon, you're in some damn rough water. Well, anyway, about the second day out, I was just high enough up to have enough responsibility that I was supposed to get things done, regardless of how. Some way or other, one of the aft uh, racks for the depth charge, these 800-pound depth chargers, there was five of them in there. Some, somewhere or other, it jammed and opened up. And here's these 800-pound depth charges just <laughs> rolling around, rocket and back hell. They took out all the fan tail 20 millimeter guns that was mounted back here and everything else. They, you know, they hit it and knock it out and over the side. So they called me in to the bridge, and I went up and they said, "You've got a bunch of depth charges loose." Well, I didn't know why I had a bunch of depth charges, but I had a bunch of depth charges here on the fan tail. Go do something with them. So I said, "Okay, I would." And hell, I knew I couldn't send a crew back there because. One time you're up here, and the next time you're down here, and then you're here. God, it was terrible, terrible. I stood up and ate for three days. You couldn't sit down and hang on to your food. So I went and got a pair of bolt cutters, and I got back within about 25 yards of it, and I just cut the damn lifelines, and there was no stopping them. They just went over the side. Yeah. And that was the only thing you could do. There was this dingbat uh, lieutenant thought I should be able to capture them and Tell put them back down. in the cage, you know? How in the hell are you going to get a brown 800-pound barrel of dynamite or, you know, back in there? So anyway, we, we survived all of that and, and was strafed pretty heavy it, one morning shortly after that by a Jap Zero, and we didn't even know there was anything around. We're cold right on the equator, you know, and I'm sitting there with a blanket over me, and that morning I happened to be wearing the battle phones. And High Harris, the chief torpedo, was sitting. We were sitting by the stack where it was fairly warm on a barrel box, and he's telling me war stories about losing a tin can in the Solomons that before he got on this one. Anyway, I heard this and I knew what it was. Damn aircraft uh, machine gun, hit sure. the Galvin machine gun. I never heard one, but I knew what it was. So I dove and under my my torpedo mount. Got about that much room. Well, a blanket flipped up, and I rolled and wrapped the, the phone lead around my neck and damn near suffocated before I got myself extracted from it. But that thing hit seven. There were seven hits on top of my torpedo mount from that 50 caliber. Wow. And when I finally got myself extricated and back out, how old High Harris, the chief, was still sitting by that where he was when I dove away. And his eyes about that big, and he never told me any more sea stories about how tough it was <laughs> down in Solomon. I'll bet. But uh, anyway, we uh, there was, uh, I don't know, I think 18 men wounded up on the bridge. There was nobody down 
on the lower deck. And one of them real bad, and we transferred him over to uh, an Australian uh, cruiser. And that was hit three times before it got out of the harbor. This cruiser was leaving, and it was hit with suicide planes that afternoon. And the stacks was, it was a pretty old cruiser, and the stacks were pretty tall, and they just looked like they'd been bent over sideways, you know, these, from these suicide planes. From those planes, planes And uh, <clears throat> then it, we went back for uh, to Lady Gulf and uh, done a little more playing around and, and uh, of course like I said we, we missed Iwo Jima because or not Iwo Jima yeah Iwo because we were in you know floating dry dock in the Philippines getting our hull sounded out because they thought they'd cracked the keel and the old man dumped all those well, dead dumped the can. so we go up to uh Okinawa. What happened to that boat in tow, that ship that was in tow? We were towing it. It was under its own power. Oh, it was under its own power. Yeah, it was oh, under its own okay. power. Yeah, and they got it. Yeah, it was, there was nothing wrong with the ship. It had a hell of a hole in it, but, uh, you know, it was watertight. But it, it would run. It would go. Yeah, okay. But they abandoned it, thinking that they'd, they'd lost it. And, and uh, they called and said, what? And so we got a chance to do that. That was another one of the good things about having an officer that didn't know straight up. They give him every bad thing there was coming along. <laughs> like when we went into the Lingayan Gulf, the first night we was there, after we got back in at the hurricane, we somebody had to stay there and harass fire during the night. Well, we was picked to do that. And the next morning we looked like a, a traveling troop of uh, minstrels. You know, all you see were your eyeballs because. During the night, you had to fire flashless powder, and the stuff just put out a greasy Black. sludge. Yeah. And it was every place. And it burned the hell out of you, too. You had to get it forced off you. But every place it hit you, you'd move it just a little bit, and it was just like you'd grease, you know. Anyway, we, we fired there until we was out of ammunition. We, we was completely dry by the time that battle was over. One time, we was at battle stations for 72 hours. Wow. And uh, drank barley soup from a three pot, three gallon Joe pot and a tin cup. That was all we had to eat or drink in 72 hours. And this J.D. Whitfield, uh, our new commander, within an hour after securing, clean sweep and swab down for and after be a captain's inspection. <laughs> he was quite a man. Anyway, we went on to Okinawa. And like I said, we was 20 minutes into the operation and we got hit. There was two Jap valves flying across these little islands called the Ryuki Islands that are just, just south of Okinawa. We really weren't, weren't even into Okinawa. We were right out in the outskirts. And we were screening for the California, and she was a flagship that morning. And by screening, I mean you, you go around and around sounding for submarines. and if there's firing going on, you'll fire on her quarter, and then you'll fire on this quarter, and then you go behind her and fire and fire. And we had just just started into the operation, 20 minutes into the operation. You know, hell, it's not any, anything for, a, for a armada of ships. There was four or five wagons and probably 15 or 20 heavy cruisers and 30 or 40 bobtails, I don't know, a couple hundred tin cans. So, uh, we pick up these two Jap valves, and I don't think another ship ever fired at them. But about eight or nine rounds, and we knocked one of them down. And that other bastard just got around behind us and flew into 45 gun mount and exploded all of the ammunition in that handling room. And it just barely raised hell. I mean, there was quite a few boys killed and a lot wounded. And done away with all of our facilities. In between number three and number four gun mount. I mean, it took it clear to the main deck. And I seen him coming, in, and I knew he was going to hit us, of course. So I asked this striker, his name was uh, Livingston, and I don't know why I always called him Stangley, but he was a real card. Every time we was in battle, I'd make Stanley wear the phones and sit there beside me on the mount. And his eyes get real big, and I said, what is it, Stagg? And he said, oh, we got 20,000 bogeys at five yards. He always turned everything around. It was 
5,000 unidentified aircraft at 20,000 yards is what it was, but he'd always say it was 20,000 at five yards. <laughs> anyway, he wasn't play very playful that morning. I told him, I said, get permission to secure the mount. I'm getting the hell off in this, this gun deck up here and get down on the main deck. Can't fire torpedoes at, a, at an airplane. So they gave us permission to secure the mount, and I went down, and I go in aft, and I hear back in the aft 20s, and that thing's still going to hit, and it, that's where he's going to land. Every time I look at him, that's where he's going to land. Well, I seen that grinning son of a bitch just before he hit. So I'm running out of ship. Well, I got to be motion one way or another, you know, so I head back forward. And I kept thinking, you got to get down, you got to get down, you got to get down. And, and I started down, and I remembered that, then I don't know what happened. And I don't know how long I was out, but the concussion, of course, must have knocked me out for some short period of time. Because when I come to, there was, you know, a lot of activity, everybody running around, and I'm laying here on the deck, and there's gouges all around that deck, like somebody had taken an air chisel and just rolled up chunks of the deck. And all I had was a little piece of strap in my hand. Yeah. But uh, <coughs> I went, and I went up and uh, to the gun deck, and here's Stangley sitting on his butt. He got so excited he couldn't undo the breastplate on the battle phones. And he'd run as far as the telephone leader to let him, and that's where he stayed. <laughs> and I thought that was really funny, you know. But anyway, that none, none of it was funny. There was so many casualties, and guys butchered, and and I went with the the our mechanic, our uh, what we call them shanker mechanics in the service, you know, medic, old Doc Callahan back, and we were looking through to see if there was anybody alive in there, and there wasn't. Just pieces, you know, yeah. in all shapes and forms. And, and Doc said, he wanted me to help him get those bodies out, and I said, I can't do it. You know, and I couldn't. And it was mostly guys that was in my crew, so I, uh, <coughs> about that time, this gunnery officer showed up. His name was Logan. And he said, Henry, there's a fire down in the metalsmith compartment. He said, why don't you go down and, put it and turn the sprinklers on? And I said, do you know where the sprinklers are at? And he said, yes, just go to the end of the ladder. And they're about eight feet to the right side of the ladder. I said, if you know where they're at, get your ass down and turn them on my, yourself. I said, it's dark down there. I'd never, I'd been on that ship for 15 months and I'd never been down in that compartment. I, I didn't know anything about it. So he did, and of course, immediately was a hero. He got a bronze star for it, but <laughs> I wasn't too much on getting to be a hero anyway. <laughs> but there's just a trash fire burning in the middle of the deck where all of this stuff had been. It was gone. And immediately I look over on the port side of the ship, and we had these K-guns. And there was three K-guns, each with a mounted 300-pound depth charge in them, and then a rack with three which made a total of 12 depth charges, 300 pound depth charges. And they're just riddled with shrapnel. And this TNT, I, I don't know even what stuff is, but it's dynamite. It was, looked like tar and it's just curling out of those holes, you know, from the heat. And here's this trash fire burning, sparks flying around. Once in a while a 50 caliber from that plane going off in there. So I run back to the shack and I met the chief torpedo man about that time and we each grabbed a speed wrench and I don't know how long it took Harris on the other on the starboard side but I, it didn't take me much longer than telling the story to get the detonator pulled on them goddamn things and get them kicked over the side <laughs> man it was hot oh what do I say it was hit the second one there was nobody else hit that day, and the next morning this, this other ship was hit. And they told us if we could get our ammunition over onto the old Texas, Battle Wagon Texas, which was just acting as an ammo wagon mostly, that we could get the hell out of there. And I mean, everybody, including the officers, was carrying ammunition. We was, <laughs> we was wanting to you know, get in other parts of the world, you know. So, 
we got everything off. The only thing, the reason we had to get rid of our ammunition is we didn't have any guns to fire. The gyros was all messed up on them. The one night and they're firing up here the next time down here. No stabilizers. I still can't think of the name of that destroyer. Anyway, we left about dark that evening. And I'm sitting out on the fantail of that destroyer. And we're not doing more than about four or five knots. Not enough to create a wake, thank God, or I wouldn't be here today. But there's a Jap Betty flew over, which is a four engine, looked like a British Lancaster bomber. And I swear if I'd have had a rake, I could have knocked that bastard out of the air. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, well, man, it was right on top of us, you know. But they either wasn't paying no attention to what was going on, or they was, you know, we wasn't putting up enough wake. There was no moon or nothing. And uh, he kept on his merry way, and boy, we was about to call him back because we didn't care about meeting up with him. <laughs> All we had was some shotguns with 12 gauge shotguns with board ship, and that was about our firepower. It took us 43 days to get from Okinawa to Pearl Harbor. In 43 Korea. days? 43 days, wow. and I lost about 45 pounds. <laughs> we didn't have any groceries. We had wormy rice and buggy beans, and I mean, that was it. We didn't even have any seasoning, no coffee, no nothing. Is that right? When we got hit, it, we had four fuel compartments on that tin can, and it ruptured three of them internally. And lost all of our clothes, our food, our everything. You knew our showering, our bathroom facilities were what was gone, inside. huh? Yeah. You showered in a in a fire control main, you know, you turn the deal on and salt water and man that leave you live red for a while. Anyway, we pulled into uh, Pearl right under Diamond Head and the barge came alongside with ten gallon cans of cold milk iced down <laughs> and fresh pastry by the dozens and dozens of there was only about 120 of us I think left the port ship. How big was your original contingent? On that ship? Uh, 315. So you lost half of them or yeah. better? Well it was pretty time everything was said and done there was a lot of guys transferred later that wasn't figured in the, you know, with minor stuff. Yeah sure but still. Anyway there was uh, and we, they had a big party for us in Pearl. I, I, was, I don't know how come I was so late getting off the ship. I was usually the first one off for Liberty, you know. <laughs> and uh, I'd always have to stand inspection in the OD and say, lift your pants legs, Henry. And I always wore Argyle socks. I never wore regulation socks. And I'd never wear their damn boxer shorts. I wore chalky shorts. That was the only concessions I never made them. <laughs> But anyway, I, I come off late and there's a Marine standing at this gate and uh, I see a bunch of guys back behind there, a bunch of young girls and, and sailors. And, and of course, there was just a barbed wire fence around the thing, so there wasn't much activity going on other than drinking and playing and raising hell. And he said, you're a survivor, aren't you? And I said, hell, I'm a survivor of everything. And he said, no, I mean, did you just come off in that tin can down there? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you belong in here. He said, the Navy's throwing a party for you boys. So I went in and we had a lot of bit of oil and stuff, you know. But we got underway and hit hit uh, San Francisco, Mare Island, where it was our place that we got repaired. And uh, they had the Navy band out when we were docking. The next morning, <coughs> we were called out on the deck or on the dock in dress canvas, and they hung a big medal on this little bastard. It was our captain for his heroics and at Okinawa. It was his fault that we got hit. If we would have been going flank speed on a zigzag course like we were supposed to be, like I said in the record that we were doing, we could have outmaneuvered him. We outmaneuvered a lot of them, put them in the drink. Once they commit themselves, they're, they, they're locked on. They, they can't do much about it. Anyway, then we went up with a couple of, we elected a couple of spokesmen and, and went up before the fleet admiral, which was a, 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 the religious guy, the, what they call him, the chaplain. Okay. And he was an admiral, a rear admiral, and uh, told him our grievance that we, we wanted a new captain on that ship or we wanted to transfer from the ship, or he could just forget about it, we'd all go over the damn hill. 
And he said, I want to tell you, boy, something. He said, you don't have to be on the high seas to mute me. He says, I'm not going to say anything, but he says, this better not go no farther. So we each got 30 days leave plus travel time because we drew 90 days yard time to put this tin can back together. <coughs> well, I was in the first leave group that left, and I come home, and I no more than got home, was home about a week, and I got a call from the telegraph here in Sterling that I had a telegram, and I said, what's it say? And she said, you know, I can't tell you that. You've got to come in and pick it up. And I said, is it from the War Department? And she said, yes, it is. And I said, well, you know, it could be pretty important. Because I said, I live way out here in the Tuleys. I live a mile and a half out of town, you know. I still live way out in the Tuleys. It may be a week or ten days before I get back into town. <laughs> so I said, uh, why don't you just tell me what it is? And she said, well, you promise that you'll pick it up. And I said, sure, I promise I will. So your leave's been cut by seven days. First leave I ever had, you know. Been cut by seven days. Immediately, my mother started crying. She said, what are you going to do? And I said, hell, I'm not going to do anything. I'll pay for it in my pocket. It says, I'm good until this time here. So I report back to the ship within the hour when it says on my paper they're supposed to be there. Well, the first guy I ran into is Chief Torpedo Man. Henry he said, you really screwed up. He said, a transfer come through for senior second. And he said, you're over the hill. And I said, what do you mean I'm over the hill? He said, you're you got a telegram. You're seven days late. We all got telegrams. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I never got a telegram. Oh, bullshit. He said, you got a telegram. And I said, no, I never got a telegram. So it wasn't 30 minutes, and I get a call over the PA system, Henry TM2C, so you report to the executive office. And the executive is a guy named John Cotton, and he had the coldest ice blue eyes, and he could just sit and bore a hole through you. <laughs> what he done with me? <coughs> said, how come you're late? I said, I'm not late. My record, my, my paper say I'm supposed to be here this morning. I'm here. He said, you got a telegram. I said, sir, I did not get a telegram. I said, you go pull my records. I said, I've, I've not had one day bad time any time, as long as I've been in this outfit. He said, I know that, but he said, you're still over the hill seven days. <coughs> I said, well, I don't know how I could be when I have no no notification that I was supposed to be here. If I'd, have, if I'd have gotten it, I said I'd have been here. So I'm about ready to confess that, hell yes, I did what I do <laughs> about it, but anyway, I thought Portsmouth prison and everything else was just across the border. So he said, well, you, you come back here at 0 40 or 1400 hours. He said, I want to find out something. So I went back and he sat and bored holes through me again for about five minutes and pretty soon he said, what kind of a town is Sterling, Colorado? I said, well, it's just a little old sleepy cow town, but I just give my front seat in hell to be there. Pretty nice place, really. Well, he said, it must be just a little old sleepy cow town. He said, we found your telegram. And I said, if you sent it, it probably is there because I didn't get it. He said, that's why it was in the basket down at the Western Union office. So I get my transfer, <laughs> an open order transfer off in that tub that I was to report to Goat Island, Treasure Island. Well, you can, from, from Mare Island, you can see Treasure Island, it's right over under the Golden Gate, or just off the Golden Gate, the other side of Alcatraz. Probably a 30 minute boat ride at the very most. Well, it took me three days to get from Mare Island to, to Goat Island, and while I was on a I drank everything I could find that I could drink and, and, and done everything I could do that I shouldn't have done. And I had all of my records with me, <coughs> and they had a hard seal on the thing, you know, like the old-time seal they'd done with the ring. I managed to break that loose, and I read my whole record until I found out that I didn't have flat feet, I just had depressed arches, <laughs> and I had a heart murmur, and I had scoliosis. And I thought scoliosis was probably something that you contracted in the South Pacific until I found <laughs> out what it was. Anyway, the last entry in there was 30 days plus 7 days travel time. 30 days plus 4 days travel time. So I slipped that out, went and reported it at Goat Island and found a berth over there. No more than got there and there's here's glancing off in the wall that anybody hasn't had to leave in the past 12 months reports such a building. So, man, I'm over there before 
they could figure out anything. He said, I had it in my service jacket, and he said, how long since your last leave? And I said, what are you talking about? What's a leave? <laughs> he said, oh, but don't be smart. He said, when was your last leave? And I said, I had never had a leave. When the hell did you enlist? And I said, November 17th, 42. And he said, well, you've got to have had a leave. I said, tell me when I had it. He opened it up, and he said, by God, you have one. And boy, you talk about the red carpet treatment. <laughs> Sent it home. So I was I was home for 30 days and gone for about 10 days and home for another 30 days. So I made up for all of it. You know. And that's what I met my wife and, and uh, started down that trail. So anyway, my last three or four months in the service I spent as a special shore patrol taking married men back for discharge. I took three trains to Chicago and one to St. Louis and one to Boston. Troop trains. And there again, he was always on open order, so it'd take us five or ten days on the troop train and 15, 20 days to get back quick as possible way on naval air transport. We wouldn't catch a flight that was more than 300 miles, you know, because that'd be getting home too soon. So I was discharged January 16th of 1946. So I spent four Christmases away from home because of them damn gaps and I never will forgive them for it. I still hate them. So that's my war story. A lot of other things happened that that was kind of funny. How many how many of your boys were there? Two. There was five of us boys. Five five boys. Mm -hmm. I had and three how many of you were in the service? Two. Two of you. I had three older brothers and one younger brother. Okay. Harley was too young to go. Harley in fact I think went to school with you. Yeah, I think he did. Yeah, right. yeah. But uh, my brother died. My oldest brother went. He enlisted in December of '42. He was married and had two children at the time. But he uh, and I don't know why he enlisted and went because after he went, he decided he didn't care for it. And he, every time they'd open the gates, he'd take off on them. Told about being in Texas one time. They was getting ready to go to Africa, and he said. His commanding officer called him in and he said, Henry, he said, I've been real good to you, haven't I? And Don said, yes, you have. I'll do anything I can for you. He said, well, I want you to do me a favor. Don said, you name it, you got it. He said, go get your goddamn gear and find yourself a new commanding officer. Don said, it just broke his heart. Thought he'd really been doing a good job. <laughs> anyway, that's about all it. So you got back from the service. Now, we always ask everybody this. Um, we want, I want you to show Sherry all your awards and citations. We're going to put them on the on the film. But you got back from the service, okay? Then what what happened to you then? When did you get married? I got married in July of forty six. Forty six. And what was your wife's maiden name? Roth. Lorraine Roth. Lorraine. Roth, okay. And okay, so you guys got married, and, and then what happened? Tell well, us a little we bit. We started about having babies. That's service. about all that happened. Hmm? I, I went into business with my two brothers. Uh, pouring concrete and cement contracting, and uh, it was before the days of ready mix. And we had a big old three sack mixer that we charged with a Ford tractor. And uh, God, we run a lot of concert floors and streets and everything else with that old thing. We mix a lot of mud, <coughs> but we were the first ones in the country to do feed bunks and uh, flip worm ditches. And my brother Cecil. Oh yeah, Cecil. Cecil did a ditch for me. Yeah, after I left, why well, he continued the business and was always cussing the Democrats, but they were the ones that was always putting up the money to put. The yeah, oh yeah, they, in. <laughs> that's right. They paid for those ditches. He was a, <laughs> Cecil was a real good Republican, but he, he <laughs> sure liked that Democrat money that was coming in for the farmers. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I uh, my dad. I, I didn't get many letters from home because I was real bad about writing home. I'd go make every mail call, but uh, in fact, I lost a letter with some money in it for my mother in Norfolk, Virginia. I, I usually about the first place I'd hit with the bars, you know, and tank up a little. I, I maybe I stuck this letter someplace and thinking I'd mailed it and it just sailor found it and sent it on to my mother, just put it in another envelope, a little letter, a little letter. 
And I swear she communicated more with him than she did with me. I, <laughs> I just didn't get any mail. But then I didn't write nobody, you know. Yeah. I, didn't, uh, I didn't make any long-term commitments on anything, any place. Because like I said, I knew from the time I was 15 years old I was going to be in the service at the fighting for my country, and I was ready. I, I was ready when I was 15 if they'd let me go. Yeah. I'm damn glad that Dad tore up those papers that I'd signed on with the Gyrenes in 41. But yeah. So, so you and your wife got married, and you had a family? You had some children? Yep, we have five sons. Okay, tell us, tell us a little about your sons. you got some pretty cool sons. Well, my oldest son uh, is a double degree bartender. He's, he's got two college degrees and he owns a bar downtown here and a small used car dealership out on West Main. Trevor is his name. And when he was 16 months old, we had a set of identical twins that we didn't know was on the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. And my wife had kind of a tough time when she had Trevor. So she kept telling me, she said, boy, this is a big baby. He's kicking up here and he's kicking down here. And we had no suspicion that he was twins. Twins. They were identical. So she said, I'm not going to lay up there like I did with Trevor. I'm not going until I'm ready. So about 3 o'clock one morning, she called me. In fact, it was February 4th, 1949. And I take Trevor over to her sister's house, and, and I come back, and, and she's sitting, drinking a cup of coffee in her house, and I said, are you ready to go? And she said, oh, not yet. So I don't think I ever sit down. I stood with my hand on the door handle and the car running, and about a quarter to nine, she said, well, I guess we ought to go. So I put her in the car, and I took her with the old St. Benedict Hospital. And I called my mother, of course. And I'm sitting down in the office reading a Life magazine. And my mother comes down the hall crying. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, just holding up two fingers and crying. And I said, what the hell's the matter, Mom? And I'm starting all the sorts of things going through my mind. And finally she said, you got twins. Hell, I couldn't afford one more, let alone two more, you know. <laughs> We'd been up high enough, I'd have jumped out the window and ended, ended it, I think. <laughs> anyway, the, we had identical twins. Yeah. One of them is in Phoenix, Arizona, the oldest boy lives in Phoenix. And he's the one that worked here with you, Dan. Oh, Dan, yeah, sure. He he done all sorts of things. You know, he got a college degree right. and something and then went back for two more years and got another degree and something to do with computers. Yeah. I don't want to take that. Yeah. six years to learn about computers, but anyway, he must have learned it pretty well because he, he made a lot of money in that. And made more money than we were paying him. Yeah, probably, <laughs> but... Uh, we missed him. He was good. <laughs> he, uh, he was working for uh, that big feedlot operation in, in Greeley, and he wrote a computer program for the hog buyers that all they had to do is put it in the computer and the breed a hog and about what the hog weighed and it would tell them what that hog would butcher this hour for, you know, with everything, what it was worth, everything. Well, anyway, they sent him back to Chicago for about a three or four day deal. And when they came back, he had like 15 or 16 guys in this part that he was in charge of. He walked in and they terminated him. They give him like six months pay. And they said, hell, we don't need you. Your staff can, you know, you, you've got everybody so well trained, we don't need you around here. Oh, oh, oh really? So he goes to uh, hanging around up there in the mountains playing the slot machine and things. And I don't know how he got next to this deal of buying equipment that was coming back in off and lease. But he'd buy uh, bank teller machines. He bought, I think, 18 machines that was being replaced in New York City from Chase Manhattan Bank that they had leased for all these years. And he bought them for salvage price. Well, it, he got 
when he was supposed to get possession of these, and he had junked them out to a dealer in Florida. When he was supposed to get possession of these machines, they didn't come through. So he called and he said, what am I supposed to do, send a truck around as a bolt cutter and cut these damn things and load them up and take them off? He said, no, Mr. Henry, we don't want you doing that. Well, he said, when am I going to get possession of my machine? He said, well, I, we haven't changed our program the way we thought we were going to, and we're not sure we're going to now. Could you lease us these machines for, I think it was 18 of them. Stan said, no, I couldn't lease them to you. I have no, no uh, setup to do that. So he wound up, I guess, speaking to the president of Chase Manhattan Bank eventually. And, uh, <laughs> The man said, well, I guess about the best we can do is buy the damn things back from him. And he said, what do you got to have for them? And Dan said, well, I don't know. He, of course, Dan didn't buy them from the bank. Dan bought them from the salvage company. Police company, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think he figured ten times what he had in them, which was a pretty good chunk. And uh, they just sent him a check for it. You know. But he'd done that on several occasions. I don't know. He made about a quarter of a mil that one year just screwing around. Trading, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But he, hmm? he, he does some, uh, you know, just work off and on for different places now, whatever he feels like, I guess. Owns a nice home there on Davidson Avenue in Phoenix. And Dallas is working as an as a insurance adjuster here. Right. Getting okay. on real well. And Justin, my, we had a single and a set of twins, and then Justin, and he works with me, or I work with him actually in carpenter work. <laughs> over in, done a basement at Sherry's <laughs> place and, and done some work on her house. And we've done work on about everybody's place in the country, it seems like, including the old life clinic down there a few once upon a time. But uh, then our last, we had another set of twins, but uh, one of them was a hydrocephalic oh, yeah. and lived for five months. And uh, of course, it had to be cesarean. Lorraine was scheduled to go in for cesarean, and, and uh, she went into labor about a week before she was scheduled to have them take it. And Jimmy was in the birth canal, and, but couldn't be born, I guess. Anyway, he is uh, epileptic oh, wow. and is still home with us. Ran his own business for several years, had service station business for a lot of years, you know. Anyway, they're all good boys. Only had to bail one of them out of jail. Well, he didn't have to bail him out of jail. I just went down and got him one night. Did you? Barney and I were doing yeah, that's that right. Yeah. 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 Barney, good kid. Yeah, he was. I think Barney was killed in the war. No, Barney was killed on a reserve flight. He was flying out here, I think, at Buckley. Was that right? And I think, I think. Right after the war. Yeah, it was just right after the war. Okay. Okay. Just two days from being a year. 15th of November, 1943. Crossing the equator. Well, that's a big deal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it lasted all day long. They beat the hell out of us. Oh, yeah, right. They took uh, <laughs> canvas and sewed it up and stuffed it with rags and soaked it with salt water and knocked you flatter than hell. Really? Anyway, the trolley logs. So we took over the ship and got all the shell back except the captain down in the forward hold. And we had washed them down in there with fire main and wouldn't let them back out. <laughs> so all of a sudden, kerboom, number one mount, gun mount, fires about two foot above our damned head. And when we had recoiled, why all of our shell backs had escaped. But the captain had just ordered around just to see if the gun would work, you know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but anyway, we smelled those steaks of frying for supper. And finally, we went down to mess all and we had a bowl of water and a soda crack. And that was all day, that's all we had. Uh, anyway, that was quite a quite a deal. Yeah. The chief escort ship going into Tokyo with the Missouri. Oh, when they signed yep. the uh, X ray. Yep. I wasn't on it because I got transferred off in June of yeah. uh, forty five. But this just tells about and there's not much on the Kimberly because I didn't know about this Sholin when he was writing this book. This guy was an electrician's mate. And, uh, 
Anyway, back here where I've got your letter was all of the ships that were hit with the suicide plane sunk. There was eight ships in the squadron, eight destroyers, and the, they were all sister ships to the ship that I was on. And there was two of them left to float at the end of the war. Is that right? Three of them were sunk and three of them were junked, and it was us in the ship called the Isherwood. Then it came back out and was on the Yellow River every night during the Korean War. Oh, is that right? They put it back in mothballs and then dragged it back out in about 1962 or 3 and outfitted it and sent it to Taiwan. And it's in the Taiwan Navy now. It got, of course, different call numbers, but yeah. it's still there. I'd know it if I went aboard it because the port side of the ships caved in about six inches from a real hard turn we took up in the Aleutian Islands avoiding torpedoes. Fired at us. 